body. Get a good look at, at you before they turn the lights down. How many of my uh, students are here? Well, howdy. <laughs> All right. Uh, ASU? Welcome, welcome. <laughs> Argosy University? <laughs> All right, so um, my name is Tim Franklin. My name's right up there. Um, my partner, uh, Phyllis, uh, couldn't make it tonight. She testified in court all day and was veclempt, and so uh, she could not make it. I'm sure she'll be here for the next one. So I am going to be lecturing for her as well. So I do apologize if you're expecting uh, Detective Walker tonight. Um, we're going to cover some interesting ground. And what's the Latin saying for buyer beware? Somebody? What, what? Yes, caveat emptor, that's right. I want to give you a little bit of caveat emptor. We're going to be talking about some heavy duty stuff tonight. This is not light subject material. This is not light reading, nor is it for the faint of heart. We're going to talk about some cyber crimes. Yeah, you know, important stuff. Uh, but we're also going to be talking about sex crimes. And I teach that at ASU. I've been investigating sex crimes off and on for 23 years. And uh, I want to warn you that uh, I'm not going to pull any punches. Okay? So um, we're going to talk, and then I'll answer some questions uh, towards the end. If you have anything absolutely burning in the middle of um, me talking and I can't see you, just shout it out, and we'll, uh, we'll get it done. So I hate PowerPoints. Anybody that's ever taken one of my classes, this is about the extent of what you're gonna get. <laughs> Just kidding. No, I'm really not. So, um, the young man who introduced me said I'm a criminal profiler, and that is absolutely true, but so are you. Uh, anybody who knows anything about human emotion, and if you're a people watcher, you're also a criminal profiler. I started profiling um, professionally here not too long ago, actually just over the summertime. Uh, I actually did some criminal profiling for the Secret Service, but we're not gonna talk about that because it's, it's a secret. <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> it's not a secret. Uh, Anybody that took my Psych 101 class and maybe uh, my ASU classes, we talked about the freeway shooter. And the reason I bring that up is because knowing about human behavior can give you the motivation to understand why people do certain types of crimes, including the two that we're going to talk about tonight. But really, you're not born a criminal. You may be born into a criminal family, you may be raised and taught criminal enterprise. You may even decide by watching your friends that you want to be a criminal. But at the end of the day, you're not born a criminal. And so there's a, there's a road, there's a path to get there, just like there are for cyber criminals and sex criminals and drug criminals and everybody else. Your first crime is normally not a bank robbery. Your first crime is normally not a rape, nor is it hacking into Target. Your first crime is normally something very low that nobody will really notice, and you get away with it. So you get more emblazoned and emboldened by it. Is that even a word, emboldened? Any English people in here? Yeah, that's a word, I hope. Anyway, um, you start out small and you work your way up. People who uh, drink and drive. Who does that? <laughs> Don't raise your hand. Because <laughs> I'd still have a badge. <laughs> People that drink and drive, the statistics say, as my classmates know, that you drive 80 times before you get caught for the first time. 80 times you drive intoxicated before you get caught. 
So the same is true with a lot of other crimes. So back to people watching. I kind of learned how to do that as a uh, shoe salesman. Tom McCann, Riverside, California. I was 16 years old and I had to learn how to sell shoes that were ugly. I had to learn how to sell shoes that didn't fit. Sorry if you've heard this story before, classmates. But I could sell you a pair of shoes that you knew didn't fit, that you didn't want, and you would buy them from me, and you would take them to another mall and return them so I got to keep the money that I got from selling each pair of shoes, even if they were for your grandmother. And that's really where I first started learning about human behavior, right? So learning how to talk to people, observing body language, knowing when my message wasn't getting delivered. I have that advantage. You guys are all looking at me, and I'm looking back at you, most of you. And for the most part, you're a handsome crowd. <laughs> There's one or two ugly ones out there. <laughs> Just kidding. Totally kidding. Totally kidding. We're all beautiful in our own way. Anyway, what's different about what we're going to talk about tonight is we have to profile people that we can't see. We have to profile people based on their actions rather than watching them. And I'll tell you a little bit about my history in a second, but uh, I was a uniformed police officer for a lot of years and, and uh, was a supervisor, a police sergeant. And so when I got out of the car and somebody was screaming and shouting and yelling, about 90 to 95% of the time I could look at them and I could decide with some good accuracy whether I was going to have to fight them or whether they were just letting off steam and I could just kind of let it go for a little while. You know, they either burn themselves out or I can talk them down. Something that uh, we're trying to teach a little bit more of, verbal de-escalation. Indeed. So I had, that, I, had that, uh, I had that advantage. And the way that I could tell is, you know, if somebody's going to hurt you in the police world, they're going to hurt you with these, with your hands. So I'm not going to look at your eyes, although I may glance at your expression. I'm going to not stare at your feet and see what kind of shoes you're wearing. I'm going to look at your hands. I'm going to watch your hands. And based on what you're doing with your hands, will determine my course of action. Do I need to get aggressive really fast because I need to preempt the fight before it happens? Or, like I said, can I sit back and just, okay, go ahead and shout and cuss, you know, water off a duck's back. I wish more people did that. We're on that, uh, we're on that path in law enforcement now, at least on the way to it. So, sex criminals are cyber criminals sometimes, and we can't see what they're doing. We can see a dig digital signature. We can see where they've been. We can see what they're observing. Cyber criminals, and I've got a couple of really cool stories for you, are probably scarier to me than somebody standing 10 feet away from me shouting at me because I have no clue what their intent is until they do it. I have no idea if they're gonna to try to steal my life, which they can do, and I'll tell you, you know, some of this has been on, uh, so when I refer to cool things, I'm gonna tell you it was on 24, hour, what, what was that show, 24, with Kiefer Sutherland, they had some, uh, they had some stuff on there that was fairly classified. So that's the show I'm going to refer to. Uh, cyber criminal can literally take the life right out of your lungs, right out of your heart. Cyber criminal can steal every dime that you have. They can plunge us into darkness for hours, days, and if they're really good, even years. 
They can change the way that we do business. They can change the way that humanity looks at itself. And when cyber factions go to war, we all notice. So ISIS, ISIL, we're all aware of who they are, I, I think. Um, there's a cyber criminal group that uh, has declared war on them. And they've dared, declared war on the United States in a cyber way. And it's scary at the information that's out there. And it's scary about, without even realizing how large of a digital footprint that we leave. You know, we, we talk a lot about the environment and our carbon footprint on the earth, how much trash we, we put out at the curb, how many water bottles we can recycle. But we never really stop and think about the cyber trash that we leave on our computer. Every time we visit a website, every time you download a piece of information, have you ever wondered? I have. This is okay. So this is really creepy because I don't know exactly how this works. But um, I see. Uh, I do criminal interviews from time to time, and then they pop up in my friends list for suggested friends on Facebook. <laughs> yes, <laughs> you're my friend. <laughs> or people that I've never even Googled show up on my suggested friends list. Things that I go to Target and buy show up in ads on my computer. You ever wondered about that? You ever really stopped and thought about, okay, so mom, God bless her heart, 80 years old, getting ready to turn 81. She works out every day. She meditates for two hours a day. And uh, I talked to her on the way over here and before I do any speech or I give any interview, I always call her because she's always harder than the speech or the interview. She will grill my ass for an hour about the subject, asking questions, wanting to know. Her thirst for knowledge is unparalleled. She just went back to uh, get her undergrad after taking a pause from Baylor University in 1953. Yeah. So I get a phone call and she's like, so this mouse, <laughs> how, do I, how do I turn it on? Well, mom, it's already on, just move it. Well, it's not doing anything. Well, okay, cool, let's, let's leave it at that. And the reason I don't want mom on the computer is uh, she's gonna get an email from a Nigerian prince and that guy's gonna rob me of my inheritance. <laughs> Screw him. <laughs> so let's leave mom off of the internet. So uh, here's a little bit about my background. Um, Cal State Long Beach grad, uh, political science. The world has changed a lot since uh, I was an undergraduate, I graduated in 1993 with a 2.54 GPA, and proud of it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I worked hard for that 2.54. <laughs> I took a semester off. I went to the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Academy. Uh, was hired by the Anaheim Police Department back in 1990. And if you remember what was going on around that time, O.J. Simpson, um, no, not O.J. Simpson, he was later, he was 1994. Um, help me out here. Rodney. Rodney King, thank you. Changed the, law, the way we do law enforcement forever, as it should have. Just like uh, Ferguson is changing the way that we do things now in Chicago and Baltimore. We are learning, we are learning quickly and amazingly. Law enforcement is in a state of flux, just like it was back then like it should be, like we should always be growing, we should always be learning, we should always be adjusting to our communities. And we're trying. So I hit the streets of Anaheim, um, I bought my first cell phone, it was about that big, <laughs> and I had a special pocket for it so that the antenna stuck out the back and hit me in the butt every time I, I moved my leg, but I was cool. 
And that was the extent of my technology. I typed out all my papers on a typewriter. And uh, the good typewriters had autocorrect, where you just push the button and it erased an entire word. Um, boy, how technology has changed. I hand wrote my reports in pencil so I could erase. The only ones we had to write in pen were uh, murder investigations. We were the first officer on scene of a murder. We had to write it in pen. And so uh, I was with the Anaheim Police Department for a little while. I was also in Air Force ROTC. Got com my commission into the Air Force. Uh, I was in the first class of non-technical major graduates, i.e. non-engineers, to be accepted into Air Force Space Command. Uh, my class had a couple of uh, political scientists, and we were scientists. I had to remind them constantly. <laughs> and uh, we learned uh, the better parts of how to track things in space. We learned how to, um, and, and my first assignment was a deep space tracking radar. We looked for um, any kind of space debris floating around out there. At that time, there were about 10,800 pieces of debris out there. We uh, looked for incoming missiles against the United States, and, and um, we did it 24-7. The, the radar is still there today, continuously manned. But I missed law enforcement. I missed uh, the streets. I missed people watching because I'm a natural people watcher. That's just, I, I do that for a hobby. And to think about getting paid for it was amazing. So I applied to the US Marshals and the DEA and LAPD and San Diego PD and Secret Service and a bunch of them. And I wound up getting picked up by the Secret Service first. It's crazy. I uh, thought for sure I would not do that. Pinkerton would have been my first career of choice. But uh, I got picked up by Secret Service and was a special agent assigned to the counterfeit squad in the Los Angeles field office investigating kids that uh, went out and photocopied notes and passed them off at 7-Eleven. And they were surprisingly good at it. I'll tell you how to do it. If you photocopy it, glue the front and the back side together and then wait till it's really busy and hand it to the clerk with a pack of gum, you'll get away with it. No, really, that was a joke. <laughs> you guys are a rough crowd. <laughs> All right, so anyway, um, I started during the Clinton administration and uh, moved into, uh, onto the campaign trail with uh, G.W. Bush, uh, trained into counter explosives and counter chemical biological weapons. Um, I developed countermeasures against those weapons, and in order to develop countermeasures, I had to learn how to use them. So um, I traveled around the country learning these various things. Uh, nowhere in my training did they talk about a cyber threat. The biggest threat we had was a garage door opener. So an explosive can be detonated by a fuse. I can light a match and light it on fire, and eventually, depending on how long the fuse is, it'll blow up. I can set it on a timer, but if you really want to be accurate with it, to make it a threat to the president or somebody else when the motorcade is passing by or you're, we're at an arrival or a departure point, you wait until this person gets out of the car or they're getting in the car because that's our, really our most vulnerable point. And it's called a command detonation. You push the, the little uh, garage door opener and it'll detonate the bomb. So what we would do back then is uh, we would jam your garage door opener. So when we drove by, uh, or you were within one square mile, uh, your garage door went on the fritz until the president was inside. It was funny to me. <laughs> Times have changed. Analog, digital, all those sorts of things. And so 9-11 uh, happened. Uh, I was in Colorado Springs doing my Air Force Reserve duty which at that point I was uh, flying the GPS satellite. I was a GPS crew commander. And uh, Mrs. Reagan picked up the phone and called the president and said, I don't have enough people on my detail. Uh, would you please send more? And uh, I don't know, about four days later, I was in the woods of Bel Air, looking like this, in a flak jacket with an MP5 submachine gun waiting for Al Qaeda to jump the fence. They never did thankfully. So for 
a little over two years, I drove Mrs. Reagan. Uh, I was her bodyguard and driver. Uh, she liked me because I was really tall, still am. <laughs> and uh, she didn't like to wear glasses, and so she could pick me out of a crowd. And uh, so she'd go like this and go, hey, Tim, come here. And, and, that, and that was amazing, and, and I got to watch people. There was one time we were going up an elevator at UCLA Medical Center for an eye appointment, of all things. And we, uh, we get on the elevator, and we're on the way up. It's like up on the sixth floor where we're going, and the elevator stops on the third floor, and these people get on, and they're just chit-chatting. And uh, they stop. The elevator's going up, and, and they just get real quiet, and they go like this. They just stand there. And they look over at Mrs. Reagan, more like down, because she's like four foot two. <laughs> then they looked up at me, because I'm six foot four. <laughs> and I'll never forget this. The guy says, are you who I think you are? She looks up at the guy and says, probably. <laughs> awesome. Oh, she was a lot of fun. Anyway, that has nothing to do with sex crimes and criminal stuff. It's just a funny story, mainly because my partner called out and I have to do some filler here. Um, so I left the Secret Service, went back into the military for a year, went overseas. And then uh, missed law enforcement again, got back into law enforcement. I actually went to work for the vet, uh, Veterans Affairs here in Phoenix just before the meltdown and uh, retired from there. And so I'm a retired federal agent, uh, happy to be retired and uh, started teaching. Um, my educational background, master's in forensic psychology, another one in clinical psychology, just defended my dissertation uh, week before last uh, for my doctorate. Uh, in clinical psychology, so we'll see how all that goes. So, um, the, uh, the thing is, is uh, what's different about me is people normally go out and they get educated and then they get into their career field and they go do great things. Um, I'm the other way around. I, I went out and did cool stuff and then got the education to back it up. Uh, so I teach at ASU and Mesa Community College. So, Cyber crimes. We are all online. Has anybody ever heard of data mining? Okay, so here's the deal. If I have a little piece of information about you, whenever I have to deal with someone even today, and I'm not sure who they are or they aren't, and I'm dealing with them in Arizona. If you Google Arizona criminal lookup, it'll give you some, some sites that you can look up. But the Supreme Court of Arizona posts all criminal records online. If you've ever been arrested in the state of Arizona, uh, within reason, they will, uh, they will put your stuff up there. And it, it includes moving violations. Then I'll go to another site. Um, and it has your picture you were taken, that, and I'm not going to tell you the website because they charge a lot of money to get, get your picture taken off, but I'll go see if you've ever been arrested there and I'll look for your mugshot.com. Because <laughs> I want to know who I'm dealing with. I want to know, uh, I want to get a jump on the competition. I don't do this with students or with in the normal course of dissertation of my daily affairs, but if I really am going to criminally profile somebody, I want to know everything I can about them. So, we, uh, I can Google you, I can Yahoo you, I can Bing you, <laughs> I can, uh, I can gather data on you for 50 bucks. I can get your social, I can get your house, whether it's an apartment or whatever. I can get your tax records if you own a home. I can see who your neighbors are, how long you've lived there. I can see who your relatives are that live with you in the house and how old they are. I can find out where you go to school. I can find out, of course, your criminal record in all 50 states. I can find out if you're a sex offender. I can find out a whole bunch of information for about 40 or 50 bucks. 
And anybody can do that. The information age is absolutely stunningly amazing. I remember when Al Gore talked about the information superhighway and we all merged onto it together. And here we are, we're on this big 12 lane across highway going down with all this information. You literally, you have more in this, in your pocket, cell phone, you have more computing power. I have more computing power in my watch than they had to get to the moon. I can find out things in the blink of an eye. It's a 24 hour news cycle. And so, um, you know, I, I keep up with CNN and Fox and, and um, Al Jazeera and BBC and a few others and USA Today. And so before I even roll out of bed, I, I see what's going on in the world. But technology has advanced to the point where if something really important comes up, my watch buzzes. And I'll look at it and I'll see if it's important. You know, did somebody get shot? Is there a murder down the street? Is there a weather warning? You know, what's going on? And it's, it's, it's kind of rude, but, you know, information is power, they say. But absolute power does what? It corrupts, absolutely. So let me tell you, I have a friend out in the audience and I'm not going to call her out. Her son just tapped her on the leg. Yes, that's you. She's a probation officer friend of mine. Um, she couldn't be here tonight to talk to me. Just kidding. I was asking her about uh, some cyber criminals. So let's profile what a cyber criminal looks like. Well, first, what does a criminal look like? Let's say blue collar um, person who does petty theft and goes in and steals things from Walmart. What do they look like? Average people look like any of us. Like me? Yes. Everybody but you, because <laughs> you're in a uniform. But yes, they look like any of us. Any size, shape, color, creed, nationality, religion, moral code, ethical code, it doesn't matter, does it? Because any one of us can be tempted at any time to do anything, just about. We all have pieces of our brain that stop us from doing these things and it's called impulse control. And so when we get a brain injury actually on the frontal lobes of our brain, that's one of the things that they test for is impulse control. But uh, a criminal can look like anybody or anything. Now let's narrow it down a little bit. Let's say Phoenix Freeway shooter. Let's, let's bring it into this town. The guy that they have in custody, I have no idea if it's him or not. I, I honestly don't. Uh, I know he has an amazing criminal defense team that's working for him. But think about it for a second. Where did those shootings happen? They happened along the I-10 corridor for the most part, right? And they happened mainly on the south side of the freeway. They happened at all hours of the day and night, but the ones that happened during the day, whoever did this would walk up to the freeway wall, pop over, boom, 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 shoot a round or two at a passing car, and then be able to melt back into the fabric of that neighborhood. Why is this important? One, the entire city was looking for this guy. One shooting, yeah, you know, maybe it's a rock. And I'm not talking the country. <laughs> Two, not only is the entire city looking for him, all the press are looking for him. Three, so are all the feds and all the local law enforcement in this entire area. They descended from all over the country to look for this guy. And he really didn't hurt anybody. Somebody, a little girl was hit by some flying glass. But he wasn't killing anybody. Why is this important when we profile? Well, let's think about it psychologically. If you want to kill somebody, guess how easy it is to do if you really have murder in your heart? Stupid easy. <laughs> Can you say that again? <laughs> stupid easy. It is stupid easy. 
So uh, for those of us that have been around Phoenix for the past 10 years, you remember those two guys that were driving around and they were shooting people at bus stops and killing them with a shotgun? It's real simple if you have a gun. This guy, whoever this was, was shooting at cars. He wasn't shooting at people. Clue number one. Clue number two. Not only was he shooting at cars, he was shooting at cars that had, um, had the, the, the black film on the windows. So he couldn't see who he was shooting at. Or she. Huh? And, you know, there were a couple instances where it likely happened when two cars were traveling close to each other, but the ones that I'm going to concentrate on are the ones where the guy popped over the wall, pow, 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 and then went right back to work. Now, if you do this in the middle of the day, and you're going to make a lot of noise, think about um, the demographic of what uh, the neighborhoods look like on the south side of I-10 along that corridor. Could be white, could be African American, could be Latino. We know historically that uh, males uh, commit violent crimes like that. Younger males, between the ages of say 17 and 23. And if everybody in Phoenix is looking for you, how in the hell are you gonna hide? How are you going to stay away and stay under everyone's radar? Well, you have to be able to jump right back into the neighborhood and look like you belong. And he was doing this, or she, was doing this in neighborhoods all along the freeway, right? So we start to think, okay, the guy is not murdering people, so he probably doesn't want to do a lot of harm. Shooting at cars instead of people, shooting at cars that have blacked out windows instead of shooting at people. And this person is making a lot of noise when housewives are watching soap operas with children at home and being able to blend back into the fabric of society in an instant. Can you think who might be able to do that, regardless of your gender or your race? So somebody who's from the neighborhood has ties to the neighborhood, perhaps, but probably a gardener. Who's going to pay attention to somebody who's mowing the lawn? Somebody who's cleaning a pool? Somebody who uh, frequents the neighborhood once a week? What about a UPS driver or a FedEx driver? Something like that. So see how we're starting to narrow down who we're looking for without even knowing anything about them? We don't know their, their color. But based on historical data, we can start narrowing down. And so, you know, we profile, why is this person uh, depersonalizing? Uh, what are their motives for it? And we can only really, um, with a degree of certainty, say very little about them, but we can come up with an idea. Remember the Unabomber? Remember that picture of him? How effective that was? A dude in a hoodie with glasses that were that big. Remember that? Yeah, that looks real accurate, FBI. Good job. We can be fairly accurate. Can we do the same thing with cyber criminals? Yeah. How? Well, there are some clues. So if I go talk to somebody and they show up on my friends list of Facebook, somehow I've left a dig digital footprint. I've typed something on a computer somewhere. I still don't know how this works, but you know, how does, how does Facebook know to advertise to me black cowboy boots? I don't know, but they do, and I buy them all the time. <laughs> they, and they don't fit, and I return them to a different store. You leave clues wherever you go, whether you're committing a physical crime, whether you're committing a cyber crime, whether you are committing any other kind of crime, you leave clues and then you start to get a little brazen because remember earlier when we said you kind of start at a lower level and you work your way up? Remember that we drink and drive 80 times before we get pulled over for the first time?
There was a young man, I won't say exactly where he was, but in, in the valley. Um, took control of the Hoover Dam. Not too long ago. Let that sink in for a minute. He bypassed, okay, this is after 9-11. This is after all the cyber attacks started happening. He bypassed all of the security systems that they have in place, both physical and computer. Then he got control of all of the systems, including the floodgates. Now, I know we're in a water crisis and there's a lot of evaporation going on, but there's still a lot of that lake left. And if we open the floodgates, what's going to happen downstream? People are going to die. He realized what he'd done and he backed out. He thought, ah, I'm going to get caught. So he waits a few weeks and he thinks and he wonders, huh, I wonder if they wrote a security patch for that. And he went in and penetrated it again. And a third time and a fourth time. The folklore in law enforcement is that he turned himself in. I don't believe it for one second. He got caught, okay, uh, because there's digital footprints. And, you know, they're just like somebody that makes a bomb. They, they tend to make things a certain way, like your grandmother makes spaghetti sauce. You, you, you make it one way and one way only, and you know it's your grandmother's and nobody else can make it like that. It's the same thing with a bomb. It's the same thing with a cyber criminal. They do things the same way because it's easy, and they, and they tend to become very comfortable. I, it's funny, as I look around out here, there's some people staring at me, evaluating this. Are you committing cyber crimes? Because I'm coming after you. <laughs> Just kidding. That didn't resonate with the cyber criminals. Just kidding. Come on. If this young man, 22 years old, could take control of the actuating processes of Hoover Dam four times without getting caught, what else has gone on out there? What else don't we know? And when I say a cybercrime can literally take your life, that cybercrime can literally take your life. If you're downriver and this guy opens those floodgates, I don't know if you've ever seen pictures of it, but there's a lot of water that comes out of that dam in a hurry. And that uh, is controlled all by computer. So what does that mean to us? Okay, so let's say we don't live downstream from... The Colorado River from Hoover Dam. What about, hmm, what about other power grids? I mean, if it were super easy, I, I want to tell you this much. The government is really good at stopping these things, excuse me. Superbly good at stopping these things because if they weren't superbly good, this would have already happened. But what happens if a power grid goes down for a couple of hours during a storm? Maybe some food spoils. What happens if it goes down for a couple of days? We start bringing in water and supplies. The Red Cross kicks into gear. What happens if it goes down for longer? Power generators run out of gas. We can no longer power ourselves. And somebody just mentioned Katrina. Yep, you're pretty much dead on. So we did a study in the Secret Service and we were studying electromagnetic pulses and basically that's the, uh, uh, the result of a nuclear expo explosion. It's, it's not the heat, it's not the blow up part, it's not the fire, it's, it's the electrical impulse that happens and, and it travels nearly, well it travels really fast and it fries electronics when it hits it. So we were studying this and we determined if you detonate a nuclear bomb above Omaha, Nebraska at 50 nautical miles, this electromagnetic pulse is going to push its way out across the country within a matter of minutes and it's going to fry electronics and computers and cell phones and everything else. 
and it's going to take out power transformers and power generators and stations and all these sorts of things. Guess how many people that rely on power, according to this government estimate that was, the report was given to Congress, would pass away during an event like that? For us to bring power fully back online, over a year. Can you imagine the United States being out without power for a year? They're guesstimating 60 to 70% of people need medical assistance. Drugs can't be made. All of the various things that we use power for. We don't know how to live in a powerless world. Um, one of the classes I teach, psychology and culture, here, I have a lot of LDS students, Mormon students, who have gone on their mission. And I love talking to them because they'll tell me stories about traveling to very austere places. One went to Cambodia, out into the hills. Talk about a sales pitch. <laughs> wow. He, he lived out there for two years with, with his missionary friend, uh, living by the seat of his pants. And so... I had a student today tell me that when he got back from a third world country that didn't use a lot of technology and he laid in his bed for the first time in several years, he was uncomfortable. So he laid on the floor instead in his bedroom. That kind of gripped me because I see a lot of that same thing with combat veterans who are returning from war. You still see some of it with Vietnam vets. I digress. So, okay, pie in the sky, nuclear weapon, power grid goes down. Big deal. Is it going to happen? If North Korea has their way, maybe. Um, let's get down to your information. Let's get down to you. What kind of information is vital to you for you to live your daily life? What kind of information is online? So I'll tell you what kind of information is online about me. I get my medication from Walgreens. I log on to walgreens.com and I renew all my prescriptions. All 96 of them. <laughs> In transit from the time I hit send on my computer to the time it gets to the server at walgreens.com, that information is out in the open. Is it encrypted? Yeah. How can you tell? There's one of those little tiny lock uh, symbols up in your, up in your browser screen. Uh, how hard is that to break? It's pretty easy. What about uh, your banking? How many people go to the bank and do all cash trans transactions? How many people actually, and this is a serious question, how many people have cash on them right now more than, say, $3? OK, I'm going to rob you all. Because <laughs> I got two bucks. <laughs> yeah, yay for me. <laughs> Not yay for you. Um, but how many people, how many of you bank online? How many of you pay your bills online? I don't have one bill, not one, where I write a check and mail it in somewhere. Every single bill that I write, you got to keep on time here, uh, I do online. I pay my credit card bills online. I pay my rent online. I pay my utilities online. Um, I buy stuff from Amazon.com. Shoes mainly. Ones that don't fit. <laughs> Damn, that's how, that's how Facebook knows. Everything that I do is online. My classes are online. Your classes are online. I give you tests online. They're graded online. Your grades are online. Your degree is made up online. They mail you a piece of paper, but now when you get hired somewhere, like I, I went to work for a, a mental health hospital here in the Valley last year, and I said, I really do have a master's degree. I actually have two of them. And they're like, okay, yeah, we'll check that out, buddy. I said, no, I'll bring you the degree. They're like, no, you won't. And uh, there was a clearinghouse. There's a national clearinghouse that they were able to check to see whether I was telling the truth or not. 
the old days of Catch Me If You Can, the Leonardo DiCaprio movie, where you, you know, fake the Harvard degree, one of my favorite movies of all time, one of my favorite actors. <laughs> He's better than Justin Bieber. <laughs> or not, I don't know. Half of you laughed, half of you didn't. Sorry if I offended you. Jeez. <laughs> um, those days are over. So what kinds of things can you do? How many people shop at Target? Mm, me too. How many of you buy personal things at Target that you don't want published on the internet? How many of you send emails? How, well, how many people write letters these days, actually send them through the mail? Like four. That's pretty impressive. I've forgotten how to write. But what I'm saying is, is you probably send emails too, and you probably say things in those emails, Sony pictures, <laughs> that you don't want out in the public domain, right? Are you going to stop sending emails because I just told you about it? Are you going to stop paying your bills online? No. Are you going to stop banking online? No. Are you going to stop taking tests online? Yes. <laughs> You're going to get an A. <laughs> you're not going to change the way you're doing business. So that means that the government has to do it for us. Edward Snowden. Some people go, whoa, he brought that up. <laughs> Thief or hero? Both. I like that. Yeah, both started a national debate about the information that's collected by our own government, by the people that are protecting us. Now, as an agent of that government, as a retired agent, the fact that this is being filmed and it's going to be put on YouTube, I fully support the United States government <laughs> and all of its activities and my paycheck <laughs> that I get online. The government protects us, but it also gathers information about us. And so, you know, we know a little bit more because of WikiLeaks and because of some of these data breaches that have happened. We know that um, the director of national intelligence, we call him the DNI, he is like the super spy of the United States. He's in charge of the CIA. He's in charge of the intelligence activities at the FBI. He's in charge of all the intelligence activities at the NSA. He is like the, the man that's in charge of all of that stuff. Had his email hacked about a month ago. This is the guy that's supposed to protect our secrets. Anybody ever hear of uh, General Petraeus? Army four star? Anybody ever hear of Hillary Clinton? <laughs> What's going on there? Well, kind of. They got hacked by the government. But uh, the allegations are, Mrs. Clinton, if you're watching this, I fully support your presidency. <laughs> the allegations are is that she kept uh, classified material on personal uh, servers at her, at her uh, foundation and that she conducted uh, business, official business of the U.S. government outside of official government channels and that they weren't properly secured. I'm not a judge, I'm not a jury, and whatever. I'm not here to debate politics. The fact that this kind of information, your kind of information, my kind of information, can be hacked by somebody like Edward Snowden scares the crap out of me. Okay, case in point. I have a student that graduated um, from ASU this last December. Uh, he just started work with the NSA Monday. Yes. <laughs> and we were talking because he did uh, two summers of internships with them. And he said, you know, of course, uh, intelligence collecting has just totally changed, but he was telling me about some of the kinds of activities that are going on, and I, I won't discuss them all because, well, I just don't want to.
If the DNI's email can get hacked, guess why your email is not getting hacked? Nobody cares. Nobody cares about your mistress. Why do they care about General Petraeus' mistress? Why do they care that Hillary Clinton may or may not have had classified information on her personal servers? Why do they care? Public figures. So when you click send on anything that you do online, the reason you're not getting hacked, nobody cares. Not that I don't care, I care. I care about you. I care about your well-being. But there is so much data that goes back and forth that it's like shooting a fish in a barrel. So if somebody from, uh, what's that hackers group that wears the funny mask? <laughs> I love them. Because they're doing war against uh, ISIS, right? So if Anonymous um, wants you, they're going to get you. If Anonymous wants your information, they're going to get it. There's somebody in this room that I know personally. When this person was very young, could hack a computer at six years old. Wow. That's not that interesting, but the six-year-old will turn into a 16-year-old. And if they're hacking porn websites and stuff, who cares? But what happens if they come after your banking data? Now we got a problem. All right, so here's the deal. Change your passwords. We've all heard that, right? We know how to make them. You use a symbol. Don't use it at the beginning or the end of the password. Use a capital letter. Use at least two. Uh, use a number. Use a combination of all three. Uh, the newest thing says, uh, don't just do random numbers and random symbols and stuff because A, it's hard for you to remember, and B, it's easier for an encrypting machine to, or decrypting machine to figure out. If you write out a sentence or a phrase, then like um, Tim Franklin loves cheeseburgers, 16.com, exclamation point. <laughs> Question mark. <laughs> it's going to be harder for a computer to hack it. So do that. Do things that you can remember. Uh, does anybody know what the cache is on your computer? It's not what you have in your wallet. So it, basically your computer keeps track of where you go and what you look at. And that's really how Facebook gets a hold of uh, your data, I think. And they can... Uh, they can um, mind data, knowing what sites you've been to and what you've looked at. And uh, if you prefer a coach purse over a pair of black cowboy boots, they know this. Uh, clear your cash out, maybe once a week. If you don't know how to do it, YouTube it. If you don't know what YouTube is, there's the door. <laughs> Dick Cheney. We remember him for shooting his friend in the face with a shotgun. <laughs> really bad timing, really bad shot. I was not working that day. Wore a pacemaker. Have you guys seen this on, on 24? Kiefer Sutherland? Guess what a pacemaker or any medical device is in your body? It has a computer chip in it, just like your car. And we were worried that somebody was going to hack into the pacemaker in his heart and stop it. They were going to stop his heart. This was a thing for a while. And anybody that had this device on them, we had to come up with a super encryption thing. And, you know, he had all these heart surgeries and all this heart problem. And really, somebody that got within, uh, I don't know, a mile that was on top of a hill, had line of sight of him, could um, push a button and stop his heart. Classified beyond top secret at the time. Now it's open source. You can, you can Google it and look it up. Cyber criminals can kill. And so 
there is a program here at Mesa Community College about cybersecurity. It's a, it's a two-year degree, and I, and I highly encourage that. I, I encourage psychology more, Ed. But, um, you know, we need computer engineers. We need people to stay one step ahead, and we need to trust our government. Uh, and thank goodness that they're doing a good job, and sometimes a really bad job. But just let me be blunt with cyber crimes. The reason your stuff isn't out there is because nobody cares to target you. If they want you, they're going to get you. You can make it difficult for them, just like when you take a night class that gets out at 10 o'clock. I teach one. And you have to walk to your car in a dark parking lot. How do you make yourself a little bit more difficult of a target? You walk with a purpose, you get on your cell phone and you talk to somebody when you're walking to your car, or you call campus security and have them give you an escort. You uh, keep your head on a swivel, what's side to side, what's behind you. Be aware of your surroundings. Park as close as you can to the buildings. Park under a light. If you get attacked, make a lot of noise, a lot of noise. I'll give you a hint about making a lot of noise. This worked for me once in a fight as a police officer. I'm supposed to keep very composed, and I give, I give direct commands. Stop fighting. Stop fighting. Things like that. I was losing the fight. <laughs> so you know what I did? I went, ah! Like a crazy person. And then I started jumping up and down, and I started doing all this weird shit, and the guy looked at me. <laughs> what? He did not expect to see six foot four me doing that. It gave me just enough time to take him to the ground and get him into handcuffs. Sex criminals. I have a hard time teaching sex crimes. Statistically, there are some victims in this room. And I'm sorry. But nothing will get my blood pressure going faster than someone who is vulnerable and has a sex crime committed against them. How many sex crimes percentage-wise are committed by people that we know? Or more? The gentleman said 70% or more. It's probably closer to 85. So that means 15% of sex crimes are committed by people that we don't know. So you're walking out to your car and you are a vulnerable adult because you're not six foot four and you can't defend yourself as well as other people can and you get attacked from behind. Statistically, that's not going to happen to you. There's one time where it will. Mill Ave. <laughs> Why? You go there to drink. What happens when you drink? You lower your inhibitions. What happens when your inhibitions are lowered? You're not looking around. You're not checking your environment. And you'll talk to people you would have never thought about talking to in a million years. Gay, straight, bi, I don't care. Transgender, you will go hog wild when you get drunk. I've only met one person that actually gets straighter when they get drunk. <laughs> His name is David. <laughs> and he's not sitting in here. I, somebody knows him and I'm smiling. Inside joke. <laughs> Poor David. A lot of sex crimes happen in fact, the majority of sex crimes happen when someone is under the influence of alcohol or drugs. They're normally committed, especially sex crimes against children, by somebody in a position of trust. Let me say that again. They are committed by someone who is in a position of trust. This child trusts the person 
who was molesting them. I met a kid in Las Vegas when I was doing some undercover work there. And he grew up in a group home. He was an orphan. Had uh, some temper problems and couldn't find uh, a stable foster home. So he stayed in the group home. One of the people in the group home, as he was coming up, starting at the age of 13, said, hey, you know, I do all these things for you. I, I, you know, I provide you with food and, and I watch over you at night and all this. Can you just, please, I need a favor. I want to tell you a secret that nobody else knows. I, uh, I'm gay and my wife doesn't know it, my kids don't know it, but I really need sexual gratification. I don't know where else to get it. What is this kind of behavior called? Grooming. So over a period of time, he wore this young man down, and the young man thought he was doing him a favor by performing anal sex. Sure, no problem, I'll help you out. The kid uh, has HIV as a result. Let me tell you another story. Let me tell you about what police officers have to deal with day, day in and day out, okay? We're emotional people too, sometimes more emotional than other people because we see so much of what's good and what's bad about society, but mainly what's bad. You don't call us if you're having a bad day. You only call 911 if, or if you're having a good day. You only call 911 if you're having a bad day. And when I show up, I gotta solve your problem. There's no 922 for me to call, right? I'm at Taco Bell, best Mexican food in town. <laughs> Mexamelt specifically. That taste of Sonora. Oh, I can just taste it right here. I'm waiting in line at Taco Bell uh, when I was with Anaheim and um, we got a 911 no voice contact call to me. Happens a lot. Um, I'm, I'm sorry for those of you that have heard this story before. There's just a couple. A uh, kid will normally pick up the phone and call 911 and then just puts it down and walks away. Well, we have to go check it out, but we get so many of those, you just kind of get inoculated to the whole thing and, okay, I'm not going to get out of line of my Mexamelt because I really like Mexamelts. That's what I was thinking. So I said, Roger, you know, my, my call sign was, um, was 108, 108, 10, 4. And I wait. Dispatcher comes back and says, I hear a uh, struggle in the background. Uh-oh, okay. You keep my Sonoran Mexamelt hot. <laughs> I walk out to my police car and I open the door and get in and we start heading that way. A struggle could be anything. But we're going to head that way a little bit faster call it code two, without lights and sirens, but we're breaking traffic laws. About three minutes later, I'm headed to this middle class neighborhood in November. The sun had gone down and dispatcher comes over and says, sounds like a 261 in progress, rape. She's listening to this, relaying the information to me. So I turn on my lights and sirens and I, I start hauling down Brook, Brookhurst Avenue or Brookhurst Boulevard for those of you that have been to Anaheim. And I keep getting updates. Struggles underway, hear screaming, hear a lot of yelling, hear male voices. Um, and there's a, there's a saying in law enforcement, you always walk into a gunfight, you never run into one. And the reason is because you don't want to get shot yourself and become part of the problem. You want to be part of the solution. So we'll park a couple of houses away and we'll walk up to what's going on because as I'm walking, I'm observing, just like I'm observing you right now, I'm observing the situation. Now, if there's a rapist there, I want to catch him. And uh, this person is probably going to resist arrest. I'm going to... It's nasty to listen to 
while you're driving and you feel helpless and somebody's getting raped and you can't do a darn thing about it just yet. So I shut down my lights and sirens about five or six blocks away because I don't want him to run away if he hears me coming. As I round the corner down the street, I turn out my, my lights, I black out the taillights and everything, and there's a crowd of people about mid midway down the street, and I'm working with a partner. And this was right after Rodney King, so we were very, very sensitive to uh, being filmed, as we should be. And we parked three houses away, we got out of the car, and a person approached me and said, uh, we have a guy on the lawn, detained, and he raped a six-year-old girl, and he raped mom. Mom is inside. I said, where's a six-year-old girl? He said, we scooped her up and took her next door. Okay. This is right, right after Rodney King. He says, we are all going to turn our backs, and whatever it is you guys do, you do. You go right ahead. We're not going to say a word. So we go to the front lawn. There's a crowd of about 10 neighbors, and they have this guy pinned down in his boxer shorts. And uh, there's a phrase. Have you ever heard the word furtive? It means like you're kind of starting to jerk away a furtive movement. I told my partner, I'll go for the upper half of the body. You go for the lower half. We'll make sure we'll get him in custody. When we were starting to take this man into custody, the crowd cleared, and he made a furtive movement, jerked away a bit, and the fight was on. And every time we started to get control of the situation, the guy made another furtive movement, and the fight continued. So we finally get him into custody. We take him and put him in the back of our police car. By this time, cars are rolling from all over the city. I tell you, when you're in trouble and you're in a fight and there's things going on, there's nothing more comforting than to hear a siren heading your way. If you've ever been in a car accident and you're sitting in the middle of the intersection and it smells like antifreeze and you hear a siren coming, you know help is coming, right? We feel the same way. So here's what happened. Unlicensed group home, buys a house in the area for sex offenders. They take six sex offenders in and let them live there and they start giving them unlicensed, unregulated therapy. This gentleman, 19, uh, walked out of the house, fully clothed, and he just walked, started walking around the house uh, or the neighborhood trying doors, front doors. And he found that one that was open. Dad's at work, working late. Mom is taking a shower, getting ready for bowling league. Six-year-old daughter is in the living room. He enters the house, subdues six-year-old daughter, puts his hand over her mouth, and raped her. And I'm not going to say sexually assaulted or molested because that's not what happened. He raped this child. How many of you are in here are parents? Do you know when your child is just cranky versus the sound that they make when they really need something? You know what I'm talking about? You know that sound? The six-year-old girl got a squeak out. And mama knew immediately what was going on. And she came running out of that shower. And the guy was finished. He got up. He was starting to put his clothes back on. He got his boxer shorts back on. And mama bear comes running out and she grabs a piece of bamboo, not knowing what had just happened to daughter. All she, all she was going off of was that sound, that sound, I'm in trouble. I need help, mom. So she takes this decorative bamboo and she starts trying to hit this guy with it, right? The guy takes it away from her summarily, tosses it, throws her on the ground, and starts raping her. This was back in the early 90s. Remember those uh, cordless phones with the big long metal antenna? When you were a kid or in some cases when you were 50? <laughs> Ed. 
dialed 911 and threw the phone. Saved her life. This was within months of the system coming online that when you dialed 911, it would tell us where your house was. You used to be, remember when you were growing up and you were a little kid, what did you have to know? Your name, your phone number, your parents' name, and your address. Remember that? Well, this system took the guesswork out of it, really to any landline telephone. Now, in a lot of cities, it works with this. If you dial 911 from this, we can find you within three feet. I broke down in my car the other day and USAA found me faster than the fire department could. <laughs> so, I'm guarding this guy in the back of my police car. My partner assumed that mom knew what had happened. But she didn't. So we know girl has been raped. He goes in and says, can you tell me what happened? How did your daughter get raped? I've never seen this look before or since, and I've looked into the eyes of a lot of really mean people and evil people. I bully bullies for a living. I like doing it. If you're a bully, I'm not your friend and I'm coming after you. I'm a big man. Mama came running out of that house, straight for my police car, straight for the back door. She didn't even see me. She was gonna kill the guy in the back seat, as I would have to, if this was my child. And so, I had to stop her, because the guy's in handcuffs. Once the handcuffs are on, the fight's over. I wanted to step aside. I wanted to open that door. I wanted to pull him out by his hair and drop him there and say, go for it, lady. But I couldn't. I was really internally conflicted because of this sex crime. And there wasn't a darn thing I could do about it. I had to let the criminal justice system take its course. So I struggled with mom, as did three other cops. Mom wasn't even paying attention to us. She didn't even know we were there. Dad pulls up. There's police cars out in front of his house. And there's four cops struggling with his wife. Guess what he did? Guess what I would do? He jumps into the, out of the car and jumps into the fracas. We get everybody calmed down. We physically, you know, when somebody is in that kind of rage, you have to do what's called a cognitive break. For people that uh, are OCD or they have a bad habit, we'll put a rubber band on their on their wrist and when they start having a negative thought pattern, we'll ask them to snap it. Kind of brings them right back into reality. We had to scoop mom away and get her out of there and get her calmed down. And then we had to start uh, collecting evidence and call crime scene detectives and crime scene technicians and such. But we did realize we had to get this jerk out of there or the neighborhood was gonna lynch him away from us. So we did. We had to take him to the hospital first because he was injured. I won't say how furtive movements. <laughs> that was a sex crime committed by somebody who was completely unknown to this person, to this family. We went through the trial process. The guy is still sitting in jail today. He is still there today. He'll most likely never get out. But those aren't the majority of the sex crimes. What about college students who are in the middle of consensual sex and they withdraw consent in the middle of it and they say, yeah, I don't want to do this anymore. A little more relatable. Maybe turns into a date rape situation. Maybe you don't even say anything. You just change your body language. And folks, how do we know when somebody doesn't want to be around us? You can feel it, you can sense it. You know, we say sixth sense. I think a sixth sense is really the culmination of all your five senses, but you can see it and you can hear it, you know. In order for you, can you have consensual sex when two people are completely intoxicated? Yes. But it's really dangerous. 
What if one person is intoxicated and the other is not? No, you cannot. You absolutely can be arrested for sexual assault. How do we treat these people like the group home guy that was having anal sex with this young man in Vegas? How do we treat the people that I arrested that day that committed the rape against the child? Is everybody okay? This is rough stuff. Okay. How do we treat them? Well, there are a couple of specialists here in the crowd, and I thank you for your service, who evaluate and treat sex offenders. Two categories of people. The mental health professionals, master's level and doctors, whether you be psychiatrist or psychologist, and then probation, parole. As a cop, once I'm done putting the handcuffs on you and I'm done testifying against you in court, I'm done with you. Peace or not, <laughs> I'm out. What about, uh, what's the difference between a contact crime and a non-contact crime? Who is a child pornographer? Contact or non-contact? Non-contact, why? Right, they're not, they're not actually making physical, they're not actually touching the person committing the crime. Here's a weird one. Last week, uh, <laughs> CBS News calls me and they're like, uh, so there's this guy going around Phoenix and he's grabbing women's butts in stores. We're not quite sure what to make of it and the police asked for the public's help. Can you comment on that? Uh, uh. <laughs> sure. <laughs> there's a name for it, I told him. It's called Freudarism. And that's the old uh, grab and go, honk honk. Happens in crowds and bars all the time, right? I don't mean to frighten you, but you've probably been freutered at some point in your life. This guy, the reason they are so concerned about him, and he's still at large, from what I understand, is because uh, he is waiting until women are alone and not paying attention in a store, and he's walking up and he's grabbing their buttocks, for sexual gratification, that's what this crime is about, and then he's departing the area, and they want to know, is this crime going to escalate? So let's put on our profiling hat. We have a picture of the guy. You can look it up on the internet. Uh, what do we know about criminals in general? Do they start doing lots of crimes all at once? So this guy's probably been uh, committing crimes for a long time and now he's just getting caught because he's a little bit more brazen and he's doing this uh, for sexual gratification but he did it five times in the period of two weeks that we know of that were on camera. Five times in two weeks, is that an indicative of maybe an escalating behavior? Yeah, absolutely. Could it graduate to something worse? Yeah, definitely. Because he's planning it because he is laying in wait, he is waiting for an unsuspecting victim, and then he's committing his crime. That, that, ladies and gentlemen, is the warning signs of a sexual assault waiting to happen. And that's what the police are calling it, sexual assault, not Freudism. There's no such crime as Freudism, that's a psych term. So it is a sexual assault. Unwanted touching by another individual is assault, or battery, depending on, which, on what state you live in. Okay, so we got the serial butt grabber. Harmful or not? Hmm. Probably annoying, right? It's probably going to be a little bit more harmful, but you know, you get your butt grabbed, you're like, did that just happen? <laughs> Wait. And then you turn around and you look, and there's a guy running away, you're like, huh. Okay, where's the cottage cheese? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, I've never had my butt grabbed, so I don't know if that's what you look like or look for after you get your butt grabbed. All right, so we got that going. What about this one? Let's get back to the trusted individual. You 
You guys remember about two weeks ago? I think it was in Mesa. Three-year-old girl, shaved head. Uh, mom is homeless. And so she would bring little girl over to a friend's house, male friend, every so often. And he uh, was getting on these... Um, Final story. Getting on these uh, gay apps and participating in, in random anonymous hookup sex. No big deal. It's consensual. Fine. Mom shaved a little girl's head because uh, she wanted the public to think she had the little girl had cancer. So she was taking her to like Walmart and begging for money, saying, "Little girl has cancer." Right? This just happened. This is not ancient history. So mom takes little girl over to dude's house. Dude starts sexually assaulting little girl. I don't know the extent of it, so I'm not going to call it rape. He invites the people that are coming over to his house for anonymous sex to sexually assault three-year-old girl. One of them comes over and he's like, nah, no thanks, man. That's not my bag of cup of tea. Leaves after he's done having sex. And then he gets a conscience and he comes back to investigate a little more. And police get involved. So they go to this house. They find a little girl in a trash bag. In the closet. Covered in feces. Alive. Boyfriend had been sexually assaulting and been inviting people to sexually assault her for quite some time. He's just now in custody, so is mom. Just like last week, maybe the week before last. There is no other crime that I can think of that brings to me more anger and more emotion than a sex crime. Nothing. Your data getting stolen? I don't care. I mean, it's important. I don't care if people know I take B12 injections. So what? I don't care if people know what I make. It's public record. I don't care if people know how much I pay in rent. It's too much. <laughs> I try to pay it in pesos, but they won't let me. <laughs> if you listened to what was going on in this crowd as I was telling these few stories, how silent did we all get? We were all present for one moment for about the past 20 minutes, listening intently to what was going on with mom in Anaheim. And there are several other stories that I just don't want to tell. You'll have to take my sex crimes class to hear them. What do we do with these people? Is there an effective treatment? No. Statistics say, for juvenile sex offenders, we can probably make an intervention, an effective one, where they're not going to recidivate. Why? Because their brain is still growing. Your brain stops growing at the age of 25, and it goes through a process, what's called shearing. You start losing brain cells permanently. Your brain just starts getting smaller and smaller and smaller. The more whiskey you drink, it gets even smaller. Mexamelts even make it smaller. I have a tiny brain. When your brain is developing, we can do an effective, we, we can turn it into habit in your head. Just like when you first learned how to drive, you had to physically think, walk up and put the key in the door and turn it and then open the door and sit down and put your seatbelt on and adjust the mirrors and stick the key in the, in the thingy and turn the engine on and I had to push in the clutch and that was just a disaster. <laughs> but uh, give it like three weeks or four weeks and you don't even think about it. Like, do you guys remember your drive here? The whole thing? No. Oh, you're a super stud. I'm not going to say who it was. I, I had to nod, yes. That's cool. Most of us don't because we get in our cars and we zone out because our brain has been conditioned like a muscle to um, remember what we're doing. The brain does the same thing uh, when it's growing with sexual assaults. We can make that intervention, and there's a whole thing to it. With adults, 
Over the age of 25, we're not so lucky. Can't teach an old dog new tricks. We have some success. It depends on the kind of crime. Are you a cyber criminal where you're watching child pornography? Can we stop that? Maybe. Um, are you a serial rapist? A Jeffrey Dahmer? Can we stop that? Yup. By locking you up in solitary confinement, maybe civil commitment to a state hospital. We have varying degrees of success, but in general, we just don't have a good grip on it yet. We just don't know. We're headed there, we're trying. We're trying to understand brain biology, and we desperately want to, but so far we're not real good at it. So what does all this mean? I don't care who's in the White House. I mean, I do, but you know, at the end of the day, there are folks that stand between us and things that go bump in the night, either in cyberspace or in our bedrooms or as we're shopping or doing whatever. And I, for one, am happy for a government that is willing to deploy resources to protect us. I am happy, for one, that when I dial 911, I know that I'm going to get some help. I think we live in a great society that way because I've traveled the world over and there's a lot of people that can't dial 911 because there is no 911. And so we continue to try to better ourselves. And, you know, I, I mentioned earlier Ferguson, Missouri, Chicago, Baltimore, and a lot more. We, as a law enforcement community, both are heroes and failures at the same time. We have to learn how to police ourselves better. We have to learn how to use our words better to de-escalate so that maybe we have more self-control when somebody makes a furtive movement. I'm owning up to that one. We have to learn how to use our words, and then we have to trust our government to stop people from taking our private data and taking the data of, of corporations like Sony and Target and Best Buy and all the other ones that have been hacked. And we're, we're, we're pretty good at it. This kid that uh, just started on Monday with the NSA, 22 years old, one of the brighter students I've ever had. I've had a lot of really bright ones. I tend to get really smart kids that, that study with me. And um, he's going to be on the front lines. He's the new guard, the new generation. I've hung up my hat. I'm going to be sitting in the therapy chair talking to folks who are wearing shoes that don't fit. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, as a police psychologist, as a forensic psychologist, I'm going, to, I'm going to talk to people after the deed is done, after you already have post-traumatic stress or after you're already depressed or, you know, You've, you've been through some, something traumatic. That's when I'm going to get involved. My days of, of chasing bad guys are over, as you can tell. The dawn of the Mexamelt. <laughs> Almost. Um, I, I hate PowerPoints, so let me see. Sex crimes. Uh, yeah, okay. Um, There we go. That's how I end my lectures. I'm like, peace out. I'm out the door before anybody else. Uh, no, just kidding. Um, I'm going to open up the floor to uh, a few questions. Uh, we have, uh, I'm going to give it about uh, five or ten minutes. And I'll, uh, if I can't answer it, I'll answer uh, anything that you want to know. If I can't answer it, I'll just be blunt and upfront. Sir. You would think so, but you are correct. The gentleman said, what about switching up your personal data, switching up your birthday on, on websites, and switching up your bank account numbers and things like that? Is that effective? The answer is yes, absolutely is. 
um, any piece of disinformation. Uh, there was just a story out yesterday, the CIA deceives its own employees. It regularly puts out disinformation knowing that it's probably gonna get outside of its networks to other countries. We can do the same thing in our own households. And so changing your passwords, changing your name when you sign up for www.blackboots.com. <laughs> My name wouldn't be Tim Franklin. Oh, good, it's not anymore. Uh, my name is Steve Jones, or Rita Jones. Um, yes, you can actually, actually do that, and that's, uh, that's a very effective way of doing it. Um, you have to keep meticulous records so you know what's, what's real and what's not, and you don't get lost in the details. Very good question. Anybody else? So the question is, uh, how do I feel about law enforcement who are caught with child pornography on their computers? Do you want to take a guess? <laughs> Throw them in jail and lose the key. Why? Be yes, yes, with a cellmate. Special cellmate. Why? Because... We are in a position of public trust. In order for me, and I'll get to you in just a second, in order for me to get my job with the Anaheim Police Department and the US Secret Service, in order for me to get a top secret clearance in the military and all the other things that I've ever done, I had to take a polygraph. I had to go through backgrounds every five years. They had to know everything about me. I had to reveal who I was living with. I had to reveal my computer passwords, just so much. They knew so much. And if I worked that hard to keep my record squeaky clean, then so should they. And I have zero zero sympathy for public figures who break the public trust. None. So then psychologically, how would a person of that power have escalated to, you know, having such a dark... Psychologically, how would somebody of, uh, in a position of public trust have escalated to do such things? Arrogance. You start just doing it once and it's easy and you don't get caught and then you do it again and again and again and if you talk to the Scottsdale Sex Crimes Task Force, you know what they're gonna say is in any one night they can go out and they can catch uh, cyber sex criminals. It's like shooting a fish in a barrel. They have to choose and pick. In fact, the uh, state's attorneys will actually turn down cases. They have a minimum number of pictures that you have to have before they will take that into account and prosecute it. And I'm not gonna tell you what that number is, but people get arrogant and they get hubris. And so people who are used to getting what they want and they're used to being in charge tend to continue that in their personal lives. That's how I would answer that. Uh, you and then you. How far is it for someone to get into your webcam when you not know? It's pretty easy. So the question is how hard is it for somebody to get into your webcam? I can't do it, but there's probably about 30 in here who can. It all depends on your encryption. It depends on what it's connected to. It depends on if uh, your computer is connected to Wi-Fi or if it's hardwired. There's a lot of different things, but it's not difficult at all. Uh, in fact, um, I have a little piece of tape across my MacBook ca uh, computer camera because I've heard all the rumors. I may be one sexy man, but I don't want everybody to know that. <laughs> Yes, sir. Uh, as far as um, identity, like qualifiers that you look for in police officers that have burned out or have emotional damages from just seeing the crap they see all day, um, what is the best, like what do you look for specifically? So the question is uh, emo emotional burnout for police officers who see the kinds of things that they see every day. How do we deal with that? Is that right? Yeah. Okay. What do we look for? We look for? Um, so. When things go to crap, they go to crap in every domain of your life. You may be able to keep it together at work, but you're not gonna do it at home. And the cops that I know that start coming unraveled have drug problems, alcohol problems, they fight with their spouses and significant others, they speed around and they're angry. And so the first line of defense is either going to be a spouse calling us 
or it's going to be uh, a line of duty evaluation. You probably are familiar with that based on what a supervisor will say. We have treatment. There aren't very many things that we can't treat. We can treat PTSD, we can treat depression, we can treat anxiety, we can treat schizophrenia, we can treat bipolar, we can treat borderline personality disorder. We're not real good at treating sex crimes, but we can treat all those other things. And so what we see is that somebody who has chronic post-traumatic stress symptoms, somebody who just goes through it day in and day out, and that's why I wish Phyllis was here tonight because she would have spoken about that. She was a, a child sex crimes detective for 15 years. She just retired last week, God bless her. And the very first time I met her, I asked her, uh, so what is it like to be a cop? I was, this was a, you know, just get the conversation going. She teared up. And she said, this job has taken so much away from me. And it's time for me to go. And she knew. She had the wisdom to know when to retire. There's a lot of people that don't. But... We also see it coming out in the way we handle suspects, the way we do traffic stops, the way that we handle the general public. If you have an officer that has a lot of public complaints against us, one or two, I mean, you're not doing your job if you don't get a few complaints. <laughs> but when we start seeing chronic complaints come in over and over again, that's when we start taking a deeper look. And we can help. We can help with the alcoholism. We can do all that. And we can get you set back right and back out on the street if that's where you choose to go. Does that answer your question? Yeah, you need to like switch what their specific role is as far as their While they're undergoing treatment, we absolutely switch what their role is. We'll take them out of patrol, we'll take them out of their official duties, and we'll put them on a desk, let them answer a phone, we'll have them do something meaningful while they're in treatment. And then once they complete treatment, if they complete it successfully, we will return them to full duty. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. How do you feel about death penalty for, for their actions? How do I feel about death penalty for guys that are too far gone? Wow. I don't know. I've got to be honest with you. I've been to countries that have the death penalty. I live in one. And I've been to other countries that don't. And I'm not sure. I haven't worked this out yet. I'm not sure if taking a life is worth all that we have to go through. Well, it, sometimes, sometimes. It, it, it is such a, a charged issue, and I'm sorry to be so wishy-washy on it, but I just, I don't know. Um, I look at uh, treatment uh, programs in some places in Western Europe, Norway, for one, and they don't have the death penalty, and they're extremely effective at treating their adult prison population without putting people to death. Does the death penalty deter people? Maybe a half a percent. When you are actually out committing a crime like this, are you thinking, oh boy, I'd better not do this because I might be put to death? No, no, absolutely not. So it's not a deterrent. Should we be doing it? The jury's out on that. That's above my pay grade. That's my one vote. Yes? How do you deal with sex crimes within the prison? Oh boy, how do I deal with sex crimes in the prison? I don't work in the prison, that's how I deal with it. <laughs> um, sex crimes in the prison are as serious, if not more serious, than sex crimes out of the prison. And I'll tell you why, because you have a captive audience. You have a cellmate that can't get away from you when the door is locked. You uh, are surrounded by people who are sexual predators um, by the very fact that they're locked up and they're not allowed to have maybe conjugal visits and that sort of thing. And so it is a uh, common in our vernacular and it is... Um, it is a part of our folklore in the United States that if you go to jail, you're just going to have bad sex. <sighs> That's a bad way to put that. <laughs> let, let, me, let me rephrase this. Sexual assault is expected in prison, and it shouldn't be. How do we deal with it? Well, can we put cameras in the cells? Yeah, we can. Do we? No. It's probably not a good idea. Um, but how do we protect inmates? Well, one of the ways that Arizona does it, I only know specifically about Arizona prisons recently, is you get a uh, briefing when you come into prison. Hey, uh, you may be the victim of a sexual assault. Here's what you do if, if, if you are. Here's how you stop from being a willing victim. 
Here's, uh, and, and they brief you when you come into prison, it's like, it's like going through job orientation at Walmart. Um, they tell you how not to get sexually assaulted. And so there are programs out there that that, uh, that happens, but it's, it's a very serious problem. Uh, two more questions. You way in the back. So the question is about the sex offender registry and its effectiveness, and how do I feel about it? I think it's uh, pretty darn effective. Here in Arizona, there's three levels of sex offender. Level three, correct me if I get the numbers uh, wrong, is the lowest level. Uh, maybe somebody who's not going to be on permanent um, probation or parole, it's the other way around, level one. Okay. Level one sex offender, lowest level, um, may or may not be on lifetime pro probation or parole is not going to get community notification because they urinated in public. Technically a sex crime, but frankly, unless you're peeing on my truck, I don't really care where you pee. <laughs> and I certainly don't want to look you up online. Level two, a little bit more serious, uh, community notification in some cases. Um, and we're going to canvas the neighborhood, and we're going to let people know. Uh, level three, the most serious means that you have a high possibility of reoffending. We're not going to let you near our kids, near our bus stops, near a mall, near anywhere. Has anybody ever seen that, uh, that, that show? Uh, I think Vice did a, or maybe it was uh, Lisa Ling did a show about that bridge in Tampa where all the sex offenders live under this bridge because in Tampa there's no place that they can live. There's, there's no apartment, there's no housing, there's no nothing, and, and they may have fixed this by now, but she did a great special about that very thing. So is it effective? Yes, it's effective in us tracking. Now, it's effective, uh, it's not as effective because people can abscond and they can decide that they don't want to be tracked anymore and they can bail and go to another state. Well, guess what? If we have any contact with you and I pull you over and you're flagged, you're going to jail, quick. We're going to call your probation or parole officer. Boom, reoffended, back to jail. So I think it's pretty effective. But is it overused? That is a question. What about the poor sap who's peeing on a tree and gets arrested for public indecency? Should that person be convicted as a sex offender? I don't know. I think that might be a little harsh. So it varies state by state. Um, does that answer your question? Yes. OK, let me see here. Uh, last question. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, like, out of all the years you've been working this stuff, like, would you say you've become, like, desensitized to, like, all the things that you've seen? So out of all the years that I've been working this stuff, have I become more desensitized to all the stuff I've seen? No, I've become more sensitized. Um, I think about it more now than I did when I was 25. Um, one of the reasons is I teach it. And so I remember every assault because I'm telling my, my story in front of the class. I, I remember what the scenes, and one of the reasons, um, one of the reasons I like uh, teaching after a career and then getting my education is because I don't just write textbooks about it. I've been to crime scenes. I know what it smells like. I know what it looks like. I know what it sounds like when somebody's in pain and they've been shot. I know what um, burned bodies smell like and car accidents and all these various things. Does it mean I have post-traumatic stress disorder? No, I do not. Uh, but I have chronic post-traumatic stress. There's a difference. So I remember these things a lot. The older I get, the more my mind slows down, the more I remember them. So I'd say I'm more sensitive to it after these years. But I, when I was in the job in 25 and 30, I didn't think about it at all. I could uh, go to a fatal car accident and go straight to Taco Bell for my Mexamelt. And so... Um, so yeah, I hope that answers your question. Folks, you have been an amazing audience tonight. Thank you so much for listening to me. And uh, I bid you a good night. Take care.